I thought I had a word about, you know, about, uh, uh, about, how, uh, about the fruits of the Spirit and how, how Jesus in the vi- is the vine and we're in the branches. And I've been trying to study this work for the last week because I've been going through a process of pruning myself. And so I thought that the, was, was the word that God had for me to, 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 to give forth, but it wasn't. And so I've been trying to study that word and I couldn't get anything out of it to preach, man. And then finally la- ye- yesterday morning I woke up and I was like, God, man, it's, it's getting time. You've got to give me something. And, and he gave me this word right here. And, and, and it was just, it, it was for me. And I think it's for America. And I think it's for us right now. But I'm going to start out in Psalms 121. And it says, I look up to the mountain. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so many times we look to other things and, uh, and for, man, for man's approval, for things in the world. But our help comes from the Lord. And even at this very moment right now, people are glued to their TVs right now and glued to their phones looking for a man and thinking a man's going to solve the problems of this world. And it's a lie and it's not. And I feel for like the last nine months, man, we've been in a storm in America. We Maybe we've been in a storm in our personal lives. Maybe things have been going on, you know, with all the craziness, with the sickness going around and people losing their jobs and all the social unrest and everything going on in the world. I feel like we've been in a storm and sometimes storms can be chaotic and crazy. And, and, and sometimes, you know, they can they, they, they uh and they can be a, they, they can be a scary and they can be unpredictable and they can be an inconvenience. And some of us, we've been through physical storms, you know, through tornadoes and hurricanes and, and things like that. And we see the destruction that it caused. And maybe some of us are going through it right now in our spiritual life, right now through a storm in our personal life. Maybe it's our finances. Maybe we lost a job. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's something in our marriage. Maybe it's something with our kids. And so, and maybe we're going through a storm. And like I said, I feel for the last nine months, that's where we've been at in America. It's the only time I can remember my lifetime where things have been so crazy man where people have been so crazy and and things have been so unruly and people have been living in fear and in chaos and things and it's the only time my life I've ever seen it like this and it's just been crazy and I feel like that's where we're at right now and I feel right now, even in the last few weeks, that, that with all the political stuff going on and, and people and people uh, 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 putting their opinions uh, out about this and that. That, uh, that our churches have become more of a political bat- battleground. They have a holy ground. That we've been more worried about what a man's going to do and what people are going to do than we've been worried about what God's going to do. And it's become a, po- a political battleground in our own churches and we let it not become holy ground. But God says this is holy ground. The only man that you will worship here is me. I don't care about a man's agenda. I care about my agenda. If you want to seek change in this world then read my word because change comes through the word and I have it right there in the Bible where change will come from. Because it won't come from a man and it won't come from his agenda. But still, we make the church a political battleground. And it's not made that. This is holy ground. So many people are looking for a man-made agenda for hope when the only hope is Jesus. We look to a man. We look for man. We look to man to, to bring peace instead of looking to the prince of peace. Right now, we're looking for a man to bring peace in this world with some kind of agenda or this or that, man. And it's never going to happen. The only person that's going to bring peace is Jesus because he is the Prince of Peace. And that's the only place where our peace comes from. It doesn't come from a bottle. It doesn't come from a needle. It doesn't come from a pill. It doesn't come from a woman. It doesn't come from a movie. It doesn't come from any of that. The only place it comes from is Jesus. And we need to realize that, that a man is not going to bring us peace. No matter he's Democrat, Republican, no matter what he is, he ain't going to bring peace because there's only one man that's going to bring peace, and that's Jesus. And so I feel right now that we're just in a storm. We're looking for things of this world to bring peace, and it's not going to happen The only man that can bring peace is Jesus. Where does our help come from? It comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He made this very earth. He made the heavens. That's where our help comes from. See, the fact is that storms do come in life. Some physical and some spiritual. But it's during those storms when our faith is tested and our faith is grown. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will lead will not lead to disappointment, for we know God has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts 
with love. And I think so many times that we forget that, that we have something living inside of us, that something that was birthed inside of us when we came to know Jesus, that a spirit that came to live inside of us called the Holy Spirit, that that spirit leads us and guides us and directs us. It's not man that leads us and guides us and directs us. The word says that when Jesus was baptized and that John the Baptist brought him on the water, it said that a dove, that it looks like a dove descended on his shoulder, which was the Holy Spirit. And it said that Holy Spirit never left. And I think sometimes we forget that we have something in us raising inside of us that will lead us and guide us and direct us through all things in life that we have something living in us that is our comforter and that is our peace that it doesn't leave us through the bad times and the hard times that we have a spirit living inside of us that never goes away there is nothing that can take it away from us man can take a million things away he can take our guns away he can take our jobs away he can do this and that but he cannot take the spirit that we have living inside of us away nobody can do that and we need to remember that the spirit living inside of us that, that, that that's what guides us and directs us not a man-made agenda When we see storms caught, when we see storms in life, do we, defe- do, we let, do, we, do we see defeat or do we see victory? So many times when storms come, we begin to get defeated. I remember I went through a, I've got this stomach issue. I'm not real sure what it is. They hadn't ever been able to figure it out what it is. But I remember I went through a season in my life that this stomach issue controlled my life. That every time it would begin to bother me, I would just shut down. I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't go to church because, because I, I, let this, I let this situation in my stomach control my life. And then finally God revealed to me, son, I'm, I, I'm your father in heaven, man. And that, that situation doesn't control you. I control you. The spirit living inside of you controls you. And so I finally had to come to the point that no matter what, if I was be, felt sick, I felt good or felt bad, that I was going to serve the Lord and I was going to go live my life. And so many times, man, when things go bad in our life, we want to be like recluses and get in our house and not come out because we don't want to face the world and we don't want to face our problems. But God said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burden and I will give you rest. And that's the place we need to live in knowing that we serve a father in heaven that will give us rest no matter what's going on in the world, whether it's good or it's bad. See, David knew this when he went up against Goliath. David knew who was fighting his battle. When he stood forth of this giant, he wasn't scared because he knew it wasn't him fighting, but it was God fighting inside of him. And we need to realize that when battles come in our life, it's not us fighting the battle, but the God and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is fighting the battle. We need to realize that. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they said, I'm not bowing down to man. They said, you want me to live on this kind of diet and do this and that, but I ain't because I serve a God in heaven. That, that, that's far greater than you and I'm not bowing down you can send me and kill me and send me to that fire but it's okay because I know the fire inside of me and the fire that I serve is far greater than any man's fire in the name of Jesus and that's where we need to live from right now even in this moment knowing that the fire that we serve in heaven is far greater than any fire on earth we need to know right now that the fire in heaven can burn out anything in us any kind of sin we're dealing with any kind of unrest we're dealing with that the fire in heaven can burn it out right now in Jesus Jesus name and that's where we need to live from so I'm going to move on to my message coming out of Mark 4 starting in verse 35 and it says as evening came Jesus said to his disciples let's cross to the other side of the lake so they looked so they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed, but soon a fierce storm came up, and high and high waves be- began breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. And some of us may feel right now in our lives, this is how our life is, man, that a storm is brewing, and the boat that we're in is filling with water, and, and the waves are crashing, and the and the lightning striking, and the thunder's rolling. And it says Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, "Teacher!" Don't you care that we're, we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I'm going to back up to verse 38. It says the disciples, they asked Jesus, Don't you care that we are going to die? They were so worried about themselves. They were so worried about what they were going through that they didn't see what was really going on they were more worried about dying than they were living and sometimes we get to our place in that life where we're worried about dying and what's going to happen to us and we are about living 
I read a commentary, and the comment, this commentary says, although the disciples had witnessed many miracles, they panicked in the storm. How many times do we do this? We get bad news, something that goes our way, and we panic and we lose our temper or our composure. How many times do we do this that we say we serve Jesus and we love Jesus and we want to follow Jesus no matter what. But the very first time that a storm arises or somebody comes against us or we lose our job or, or our marriage gets a little rough, man, or maybe our kids are acting out or maybe things just aren't going our way. Or maybe our boss at work's being a jerk and, 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 and things just get rough, man. And, and at that very moment, we begin to lose our composure that the Jesus is living in us and the spirit that we say directs our life, man, it begins that we begin to lose it. We begin to let the enemy take over our mind and feed into us it says added to that they revealed that they completely misunderstood their teacher they had seen jesus perform great, great miracles of compassion but they dared to ask if he cared they have seen jesus heal the blind make the lame to walk man makes make the sick man people with leprosy get healed and they had the audacity to ask if Jesus cared about them. They had the audacity to say, Jesus, do you not care about us? After the great love and compassion that they had seen over and over that he had showed to people. And they had the audacity to ask if he loved them. If he cared about them. How many times do we do this? After all God's done for us. All that all God's delivered, delivered us from. After all the things God has did for us. I know for me and my life, I do the same thing sometimes. Man, I get to go into a bad spot in life. I'm like, God, where are you? God, are you going to fix this problem or are you not going to fix this problem? God, where are you? What are you doing? Where are you? And I forget that he's right there. He hadn't left. He hadn't went anywhere. James 1.17 says that he is the father of lights. He does not cast a shifting shadow. We need to know that God is the same today and forever. We need to know that even though we're going through a rough time in life and things are going bad and it seems like God's not there, that he is there. And that he still loves you no matter what's going on in life. He's still there. The Holy Spirit is still living in you. That he, that comforter is still there because he doesn't cast a shifting shadow. He doesn't change because you're going through a rough spot. He doesn't change because you might do it a little sin. He doesn't change because you fell off the wagon and you started drinking it. He doesn't change. His love and his compassion is still there. He is the father of life and he doesn't change. He is the same all the time. It's us who changes. It's our attitude who changes. It's our perspective on life is what changes. It's not him. We need to know that God never changes. Their question was rude. They misunderstood. Their misunderstanding was deep. And sometimes our misunderstanding is so deep. We blame God for problems. We blame God for things in this world. And our misunderstanding of him is so deep. Our misunderstanding of his compassion and his unconditional agape love. Sometimes we misunderstand it so much. They, they reacted with fear and anger at their situation. They knew Jesus could perform miracles. What they did not know was that he could control the forces of nature. See, they had seen him do things in the physical, but they hadn't seen him do things in the supernatural like, like this, controlling this storm. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes, yeah, God can deliver me from drugs. Yeah, God can, can heal me from, from a disease, man. God, I, I, God can do this and do that. But we don't realize that in a moment right now that God can take this virus and smash it. Nobody else ever have it. We don't realize that right now that, 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 that God, God can use whoever you voted for or whoever you don't want and take that man to, to start a great revival because God can do anything that he wants through a man. God can do anything he wants. We don't realize the power that God has and the change that he can do through people. Verse 4, uh, 39 says, When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. When Jesus woke, he spoke directly to the storm and the storm stopped. So many times we don't speak directly to the storm as in our life. We are so worried about what's going on around us, the waves and the wind, that we forget the real issue. So many times we get mad at people. So many times we get mad at, mad at people around us because we feel like that they, they've, they've, they've hurt us. We feel like that they've, they've wronged us. Or maybe whatever the situation may, may be, instead of speaking directly to the situation. 
and that and the root of most storms in our life is the devil See, that's what we forget sometimes. We forget to rebuke the devil. We want to rebuke the people. We want to rebuke the pastor. We want to rebuke the politicians. We want to rebuke our boss. We want to re rebuke this and that. And we, don't for, we, 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 we tend to forget, man, that, that, that the enemy is out to kill, steal, and destroy any way he can. The, the, the enemy is out to, out to ruin our life. It says in the word that he has been sinning from the beginning. It says from the beginning he is being caused in chaos. And we forget sometimes that, 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 that we don't war against flesh and blood, but principles valleys of darkness. We forget sometimes that the enemy is who we need to be rebuking. We don't need to be rebuking a man. We don't need to be rebuking a politician. But we need to come against the devil because the devil is the one causing the chaos. He is behind every agenda in this world that's causing confusion or division. It's the enemy. Right now the social unrest that's going on in the world, it's the enemy. He's behind it all. It ain't the Black Lives Matter or the Antifa or any of that. It's the devil. That's who we need to be mad at. We need to be rebuking the metal, not our fellow man. We we are called to love our brother, not rebuke him. We need to be rebuking the enemy, the devil. In the name of Jesus, we need to be coming against him, storming the gates of hell, not storming the gates of our fellow man. And Jesus knew this. He said, peace be still. He knew it was an attack from the enemy. And sometimes we forget that. That when things happen in our life, it's an attack from the enemy. So, so when storms come, remember not to let the storm control you. But remember, you serve the one who controls the storms. Go on to say, then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I was reading some commentary last night in the Greek when it says there, and it says there, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? When it says, do you still have no faith? Do you take that to the Greek? That means cowardly fear. And most of us know what a coward is. But the definition of a coward is a person who lacks the courage to do or endure dangerous or unpleasant things. I can't tell you how many times I've been a coward. When things got hard in my life or things weren't going the way that I wanted them to, I would turn to sin. I would turn to this or that. I would not face situations in my life like I was supposed to with the faith that God's given me. The faith that I'm supposed to, the, the, the faith that I'm supposed to, when, when, when adversity comes and the faith that I'm supposed to have, so many times I would lose that faith. I acted like a coward. That hit me pretty hard when I read that last night because nobody likes being called a coward. You call anybody a coward, man, that's like nobody likes it, right? But that's what he told them. That's exactly what that means, cowardly fear. When he said, you, do you still have no faith? After all the blind eyes they had seen open, the bodies they had seen healed, at the first moment of chaos, the disciples quickly forgot who they served. How many times do we do this? I've seen God do some amazing things, but still, I find myself with unbelief. We need to know Jesus is faithful no matter what. We need to know, man, that our future is not in this election. Our future's already been determined. Our future was determined when Jesus died on that cross and he rode on the third day. Our future is heaven. That's where our future, our future isn't in a politician. Our future isn't in a man. Our future is in Jesus. And that future has already been determined. So this election don't determine our future, but it's already been determined 2,000 years ago when Jesus died and he arose on the third day. He said right before he went to the cross, he told his disciple, I go to prepare a place for you. So you need to know right now that there's a place in heaven that is prepared for you and that the future has already been determined. And the outcome of this election doesn't determine your future. The outcome of your job tomorrow, if you lose your job, it don't determine your future. The outcome job if your marriage if it didn't work if it gets broken it don't determine your future the, 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 your future is determined by Jesus and Jesus alone not my sickness not my death it's not determined by that but it's determined by Jesus alone so many times we look for other things to bring us hope and joy and freedom. The truth is that we don't need a political movement or a movement or a man. We don't even need a religious movement. 
But what we need is a Jesus movement. See, we don't need a, a, a man-made movement. We don't need a political movement, man, but we need a Jesus movement. We don't need any kind of religious movement because religious gets tied up, tied up in rules and regulations and a man-made ideas. But what we do need is a Jesus movement. We need men and women in the church because a revival begins in the church. It doesn't begin, it begin with lost people, but it begins in the church. But so many times that we get caught up in the church and, and rules and regulations and political ideas and we, don't, we, we, we never mention the word Jesus and about how he is our father in heaven and about how he can bring the change because man tries to bring the change. We try to do this and that inside the church. We try this program and that program, but we never try the Jesus program. We never come to the feet of the Father asking him what he wants. We ask a man, what do you want? What do you think would work good in the church? What do you think programs would work good in the church? We don't come before the Father at his feet and asking Jesus, what do you think would work? Because he would tell us, I would work. What would work is that men and women got on their knees every day on their feet, on their knees at my feet, and they begin to cry out God, please bring us back to a place of repentance where we're tired of living in sin. We're tired of living in unrest. We're tired of living in all this craziness. We're tired of living in fear. Please bring revival in our hearts and we begin to cry out that way. He will come into our hearts and He will bring revival. But it has to be true repentance because the Word says, and my people will call by my name if we'll turn and repent. But we forget that word repent. We want us to, to turn and things to be okay. But he wants people to begin to repent. Because when repentance comes, change comes. Because without repentance, change can't come. If we don't tell God that we've got problems going on in our life, and then we've got sin in our life, then he can't change us. And we need to know that. But sometimes we're too prideful. America's a very prideful place. And pride will bring us down every time. It brought Nebuchadnezzar down eating like a cow out in a pasture. But it also says that when he looked up to the heaven and he cried out and he said, God, you are real. I want you to be my God. It says that he restored him back to his not like it used to be, but ten times better. He gave him everything back. And Nebuchadnezzar was a man that was full of pride. And that built a statue so people could worship him. And God took all that away from him and sent him into a field. And he ate like a cow. And he, and he, and he, grew, he grew fur like a cow. But it says when he looked up to heaven and he repented, it says God began to restore things. And if we want God to restore America, if we want God to restore our hearts, it's time that we get on our knees and begin to ask for repentance of our sins and the things and the lies of the devil we believe. That's when change will come. And it begins in the church. It begins in us. And whoever, I'm about to wrap up. I'm almost done. So whoever wants to come up and, and lead us uh, in the altar, uh, in the, uh, the altar call, that'll work. We need less people talking about how to fix a situation and people to start speaking to the situation in Jesus' name. We need to begin to speak over all the craziness in America. We just need to begin to speak to the situation and not look and point out the man and the, and, and the agendas behind the man, but we begin to speak to the devil and rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. Father God, I just thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that even through storms, Father God, in our lives, God, that you can teach us things, Father God. That even through storms and in our life, Father God, that you begin to show us who we are, God. That you begin to strengthen us. And you begin to build character in us, Father God. And you begin to build endurance, Father God. So when the storms come, Father God, I pray, God, that we don't get scared and we bow down, Father God. But we realize it's a moment in time, Father God, to be built and shaped, Father God. Ooh, Father God, sorry. I pray, Holy Spirit, God, that you begin just to... Just to to speak to your people, Father God. I, I pray, God, that you begin just to touch our hearts in every way possible, Father God. I pray, Holy Spirit, God, that God, that you begin just to show us where we're falling short and where there's sin in our life, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you begin to make us people of great faith, Father God. Father God, I pray, God, that we know, Father God, that man doesn't have the answer, but you have the answer for every single thing, Father. 
I pray, Father God, I come against every attack of the enemy right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. And we bind every attack up of fear and stress and worry, Father God. Father God, and I pray right now, Holy Spirit, God, you speak to speak to our hearts right now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.